Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The sermon text for this morning is taken from Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 26. In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be, to be conformed to the, to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We pray. These are your words, Heavenly Father. Sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. Now, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You may be seated. In the name of Jesus Christ, dear fellow redeemed. So Romans chapters 1 through 3. Those people out there are sinners, so are we. Romans chapter 5. Christians have to encounter suffering. Romans chapter 7. The Christian still struggles with sin. Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 18. The whole world is groaning. The whole world is in a state of decay. And all Christians are, have a body that are, that are in a state of de decay. We also are groaning with the world. So there's all this suffering in the world. And as Paul points out in our text, this suffering is directed especially at Christians. And so he quotes Psalm 44, For your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. It's kind of like the Christian has a, a big target on him. Hit me. Throw your suffering at me. Someone, something is out to get us. And so we know this, even though we have these islands of paradise that we enjoy so much, there is much suffering, especially for Christians. And so along our journey here from this earth to our heavenly home, it sure would be nice if we had some help along the way. And that's what this section of Romans 8 is all about. St. Paul here mentions several beautiful, wonderful, practical, just amazing helps to get us from this life to the life to come. So let's take a look at them one at a time. Help number one, Paul says, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know, know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. 
You know, one of the purposes of prayer is so that we might call upon God in every trouble. So my question for you is, how's your prayer life? How are you doing? And some people do amazingly well, but I can guarantee you this, none of us has a prayer life as we ought to. Sometimes the last thing we think of is calling on God in times of trouble, and sometimes even when we are, are in trouble, we never call upon God. And this is sin, but the good news is that the blood of Christ covers those sins. But what's even further good news is what St. Paul says in these verses. We don't know what to pray for. We don't know how to pray. But what does it tell us? The Spirit himself prays for us. The Spirit himself intercedes for us. And he prays for us, he intercedes for us in accordance with God's will. God's will in that he wants us to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. This is what the Holy Spirit is praying for us. So this is the number one help. The Spirit himself intercedes for us in this life. Help number two. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. You'll hear more about this next week in the sermon based on the Old Testament reading from Genesis chapter 50. But it's interesting here that Paul says, in all things. Really? All things? In all things, God works for our good? Yes. In all things, even though we don't know how, even though we don't know when, this is his promise. We look at life here, and it could be a real struggle. Uh, this verse has often been compared to tapestry. You look at tapestry on one side, and it's almost kind of ugly on the back side, and it doesn't make any sense. But then you look on the other side, and what we see there is the one who has created this work has created something that not only makes sense, but is actually quite beautiful. And that's a nice description of this verse. We look at our life this side of heaven, and it can be quite ugly, and it doesn't make a whole lot of sense at times. But when we look at it from God's perspective, from heaven's perspective, when we get to heaven, we will see that not only does it all make sense, but that in some way or another it was all good and even beautiful. Now sometimes in this life we, we can see how even the bad things in life work out for our good, how God uses them for our good, but not always. Sometimes we're just going to have to wait until we get, get to heaven. To see how that in all things God does work for our good. So, this is help number two of the tremendous promise. A promise that we are to know, believe, cling to, treasure, so that it can comfort us. Help number three. Paul says, for those, who, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to become, to become conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. And so it's a done deal. From the very beginning, in fact, from before the beginning, from, from eternity, God has predestined us. He has called us through word and sacrament to repent and believe. And therefore, when we do, he has also justified us through word and sacrament. And therefore, he will preserve us through word and sacrament. And therefore, he will also glorify us 
because of that word and sacrament. And so you have the whole package here. And the really good news here is that, you know, you're not mentioned in this text. You're not helping out at all. It's God. It's God alone, not you. You know, we're never mentioned as some sort of contributor to this saving work that happens to us. Uh, the Bible teaches what we call monergism. Two words there, mono meaning one, and the last part meaning work. It's God's work alone. We don't believe in synergism. Synergism means working together with. We believe in monergism. That's what scripture teaches. It's God's work alone. So there's no decision on our part, no work on our part, no desire, no effort, no better attitude. We're just kind of along for the ride, you might say. It's going to happen. You have been called, you have been justified, and you will be glorified. And so a third promise, a beautiful promise here, to know and to believe and cling to and comfort us. And then after this point in our text, St. Paul starts asking questions because he wants to make sure that we understand what's, what's going on here. He wants to make sure that we know what these promises mean for us right here and now. And so he asks the question, what then shall we say in response to all this? It's like Paul is saying, did you just hear what I said? Do you know what this means are you hearing that I said that you have been called, you have been justified, and you will be glorified? And of course, our response is that this is just utterly amazing. We never would have dreamt or imagined this ourselves. It is utterly amazing. And then Paul goes on to ask other questions, and each time he asks these other questions, it's like he's saying, let me put it to you another way. So let me put it to you another way. If God is for us, who can be against us? It's like Paul is saying, based on what I've just told you, who would be stupid enough to try to interfere with God's plan? Of course, there are actually quite a few who try to interfere with God's plan, but the point of the question is that they're not going to make one bit of difference. You know, they want to try, let them try. It's like if you and I were to go outside here and, and say, within the next five minutes, I'm going to push over this great big, huge live oak, all by my own power, just by pushing. It's not going to happen. I can try, but it's not going to work. And so try as they might, it won't happen. At the end of our service here, we're going to sing a mighty fortress. And the third stanza of that hymn says, Though devils all the world should fill, all eager to devour us, we tremble not, we fear no ill, they shall not overpower us. This world's prince may still scowl, fierce as he will. He can harm us none. He's judged, the deed is done. One little word, the word of God, can fell him. Again, you have been called, you have been justified, you will be glorified. Moving on, Paul says essentially, let me put it to you another way. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Paul's point here is that if God did this, if God did not spare his own son for us, if God made sure that he suffered for us, if God made sure that he was up on the cross for us, if God made sure that forgiveness of sins was bought, bought for us, He's not going to let that go to waste. All that time, all that effort, all that humiliation, all that suffering, all that blood, all that death, all that resurrection, it's not going to waste. It's going to be productive. 
it's going to produce. And it's going to produce in those of us who have been called and justified. It's like God is saying, I'm going to make sure that this giving of my son for them is not going to go to waste. It will produce in them exactly what I determined before time that it would produce in them. Again, you have been called. You have been justified. And therefore, you will be glorified. God gives us all things for the sake of Christ. He gives us heaven. Moving on, let me put it to you another way. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? Of course, there are those who try to bring charges against us. The devil is all the time saying to us, you do not deserve eternal life. And so we can simply tell them, you're right, we don't. But it doesn't matter. Your charges against us will not stick. It's kind of like we've got this Teflon coating on us. These charges just, just bounce off. And the reason for that, where St. Paul tells us in our text, it is God who justifies. It is God who declares us not guilty. I don't declare myself not guilty. You don't declare yourself not guilty. The angels don't declare us not guilty. God himself declares us justified, not guilty guilty. And he does so because of the humiliation, the suffering, the blood, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. Let me put it to you another way. Who is he that condemns? And by this time, Paul doesn't even give an answer. The answer is so, so obvious. It's, it's a no-brainer. Obviously, no one, no one can condemn us. And so Paul explains in our text, Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. So notice what Paul does here to this question, who is he that condemns? He, he directs us back once again to Jesus his humiliation, his suffering, his death, and his resurrection. But then he adds something else to this. He says, who is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Now why does he say also interceding? Because we've already been told that the Holy Spirit is interceding for us. Here we're told that the Son of God also is interceding for us as he's sitting at the right hand of God the Father, telling God the Father, you cannot hold their sins against them. It's impossible because of who I am and what I have done for them. You can't do it. It's impossible. He's interceding for us. And then St. Paul asks one more question. It's what we might call the bottom line question. Who shall separate us from the love of God? And he gives us some choices. Trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword. Any of these? No. And these are the things that happen to us Christians in this life. Again, we have that big target on us, that big bullseye saying, hit me. And so these things do happen. And some of you have had some great difficulties in life. You've had terrible diseases or sicknesses or just a, a body wearing out. Some of us have, have lost loved ones before their so-called time was up. Some of us have had terrible family situations, divorces and broken families. Some of us have been slandered or even persecuted for our Christian faith. Many have gone through financial difficulties. And even if we haven't had any of these things in this life yet, 
you know, we still have that old Adam. We are still great sinners. And the question here that, that Paul is posing is, will any of these, or will all of these together, be able to separate us from Christ? Be able to separate us from our salvation? And the answer is no. You have the promise that the Holy Spirit is interceding for you. You have the promise that in all things God works together for good for you who love him. You have the promise that from eternity God has chosen you to to believe, to be justified, and finally to be glorified. And all of this because of the Son. The Son who was humiliated who suffered, who died, who bled. The son who rose again. So, we ask the question, will anything or anybody be able to separate us from Christ and our salvation? And we simply answer with the words of St. Paul. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Please rise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forevermore. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.